Well, welcome again to on the Acts of the Apostles. As we've mentioned before, it's really the Acts of the Holy Spirit uh, through men of God. But this book, Acts of the Apostles, is a historical uh, book concerning the deeds of the Holy Spirit immediately after, shall I say, um, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ after the day of Pentecost, wherein we saw the disciples filled with the Holy Spirit. But for me, there is another message here, and that is, is a prelude of what God is going to do in these last days. That as he poured out his Spirit upon these men, and they did mighty works during their time on earth, their time on earth. Yet, I believe, in the end times, we shall see like special wonders and miracles done throughout the church, throughout all nations, as a testimony unto the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what we're looking at, yes, is history, but also is a preview of what is going to happen in these last days when the Lord pours out His Spirit upon His church in a mighty fashion. Now then, we're looking at chapter 5 now. And, uh, you know, it's an extraordinary situation. Chapter 4 has told us that the disciples sold land that they had owned brought the price of it, or the money of it, and laid it at the apostles' feet so that they might help those who were less fortunate in life. And now we're going to see what happens to those who pretended to give all, but only gave a part. And... uh, They're called Ananias and Sapphira. And they've entered into the, shall I say, the history of languages everywhere as being those that typify liars. Well, we read, a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira sold a possession, kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter, being filled with the Holy Ghost and having discernment concerning these things, he said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? Now, this is a very important truth here that I want to dwell on for a moment or two. And um, basically it's what King Solomon said. Where righteousness dwells, there's also, shall I say, wickedness too. And uh, John Wesley made this comment. He said, we should not neglect sin in the church. And therefore, in this very holy atmosphere, yet sin dwelt. There was sin in the air. And uh, Peter said, you've kept back part of the price of the land. Now he said, while it was in your possession, you had every right to do with it what you wanted to do. But... When you gave it and you pretended that that was the whole price of the land that uh, you sold, then he said you lied uh, not unto men but unto God. And uh, when Ananias heard these words, when he fell down, gave up the ghost, and great fear came on all them that heard those things. And they realized that, you know, this outpouring of the Holy Spirit 
was not just, shall I say, a blessing from God, but it had to be understood very clearly that in the presence of God, there's not only blessing, but also judgment for those who do not walk uprightly. And that was the case here. And we shall see in revival times that uh, people are smitten. And I've had experiences whereby people, you know, pretending to walk uprightly and to be a holy life, have indeed, um, shall I say, been hypocrites. And after warning, after warning, I've seen these people smitten so that they have died. So, uh, this is not just historical, it's a fact of life. In fact, the Apostle Paul uh, in the Corinthian epistle mentions this fact that the Holy Communion service, which is partaking of the bread, which is a type of uh, the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, and uh, the wine, which is a type of his blood shed for us, there's a tremendous blessing there and privilege to come to that table. But there's also judgment there if people come with a wrong attitude or they're in a sinful condition. So this has to be borne in mind when we examine this wonderful book of the blessings of God and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. There's blessing, but there's also judgment. And that's what it will be in the last days that those who walk not uprightly but in pretense. And, and let me give you an example of this. This was told me in France. I was once a pastor <coughs> in France. And um, <coughs> there were many miracles and so forth. And in one particular case there was a French pastor who had an extraordinary gift of miracles, healings, and so forth. But his meetings were overflowing meetings. Yet, into these meetings came some unbelieving seminary students from another denomination and they thought they would trick him and so they got one of their fellows to come into the meeting wheeled by others <coughs> pretending to be a paralytic and then they expected this pastor to pray and this fellow would get up and say I'm healed but it was lying to the Holy Ghost well, what happened was this. You see, they had prepped this fellow and uh, he uh, had, uh, shall I say, his legs and arms in a distortionist position and uh, everybody could see, well, he must be a paralytic. Well, he came up to the platform and this pastor, like Peter, had gift of discernment. So he said, uh, you are lying to the Holy Ghost. You are pretending to be a paralytic. There's nothing wrong with you. But, <clears throat> so that everybody will know, you know, that God is a holy God and sees these things. He said, you will indeed be a paralytic and as you've come, you will go. Well, what happened? This fellow who had come with these, you know, hands and legs in a position of a paralytic went out like that. And of course, his friends could do nothing for him. And then he started to repent. And he sent a message to the pastor can I come, would you pray for me? And would you 
pray that God will be gracious to me and restore my limbs in a normal position. Well, the pastor was a very forgiving soul. And so he says, yes, I will. The fellow came back and that night he prayed for him and uh, his limbs were restored to him. But uh, I just want to mention, you see, that this is not an isolated case. And so uh, Ananias fell down dead. The young man wound him up in uh, or linen, I presume, and uh, carried him out and buried him. And uh, in about the space of three hours, his wife came in not knowing anything that had happened. And so uh, Peter said to her, now you had a piece of land, did you sell it for so and so? And she responded, yes. And uh, he said, you've lied to the Holy Ghost. And the feet of those that have buried your husband are coming into the house and they will carry you out. And she fell down dead too. Well, the result was, of course, she was buried and uh, no one dare join themselves to the church unless they were really sincere at that time. And that's going to get returned. The sincerity of a holy life. Well, Believers were more added to the Lord, we're told in verse 14. And now, uh, the power of God was so great to heal that uh, they brought the sick into the streets where Peter would pass by, hoping that just a shadow of Peter would fall on them and they would be healed. And that's what happened. And uh, out of all the cities out of Jerusalem too, they brought the sick, that those with unclean spirits, and everyone was healed. And with great rejoicing amongst the common people. But then the high priest rose up and they were filled with indignation because, you see, the people were turning to the apostles and they were turning uh, to the disciples and away from the uh, clergy who had no power at all. And they saw that they were losing their power and so they laid hands on the apostles and put them in a common prison. But uh, by night, the angel of the Lord came and opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go, stand, speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard that, they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught. Now then, of course, the high priest didn't know this, and so he sent men to bring the apostles and disciples out and he was going to charge them. Well, when the officers came to the prison, they gave this testimony and said, the prison truly was found shut with all safety and the keepers standing without before the doors. But when we had opened, we had found no man within. And of course, they were astonished. And then someone comes and said, Behold, the men whom ye put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. They had no idea. And they said, Where is this going to end? And uh, the captain 
of the guard and with his officers went and got the, the men, the disciples uh, without violence for they feared the people because they said if we uh, molest these people well the multitude's going to take up stones and stone us and so they were afraid of the multitude and when they had brought them they set them before the council and the high priest asked them did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in the name of Jesus and behold you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us well that was more than they could uh, think you see because the disciples were very adamant you know Christ whom you crucified and uh, of course they didn't like the idea that they were being charged with the blood of Jesus Christ so uh, in verse 29 Peter who is generally speaking the spokesman of the happy band and the other apostles answered and said we ought to obey God rather than men and then he goes on to say the God of our fathers raised up Jesus whom ye slew and hanged on a tree and and uh, he said look you crucified him but God has raised him up and uh, they were very tenacious on that point he said you have slain him God has raised him up and God has exhorted him with his right hand to be a prince and a saviour for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins and there are the two things that uh, Jesus emphasised repentance and forgiveness now all of sin that comes short of the glory of God so we're all needful of repentance and forgiveness now before forgiveness there has to be repentance and in order to receive repentance in actuality one has to acknowledge one's sin all have sinned and come short of glory of God and so in a very real sense that's the first thing that we have to do we have to acknowledge Hosea will bring this out very strongly he said only acknowledge your sin well the high priest you see and the others did not want to acknowledge that they had sinned they did not want to acknowledge that they were responsible for putting Jesus upon the cross but uh, that was a thing that was demanded well, and then one has to repent and repentance is a gift of God it means you are either determined in your thought life or in your actions to go down a certain way a certain way of sinfulness the broad path but then when God gives the gift of repentance it means you turn around and you walk in the absolute opposite direction to the one that you had been walking upon and uh, repentance is essential and then having repented then one can receive forgiveness of sins and so we want to be very careful on these points forgiveness comes after repentance and uh, then he said you know looking at his friends and looking at uh, the other disciples he said look we are witnesses of the things whereof we speak 
as is the Holy Ghost. And then he says, whom God hath given to them that obey him. Now that's very important. You see, God will give you the Holy Spirit, the same anointing that Peter had, the other disciples. You know, the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the initial signs of speaking in other tongues, there is a promise. It is given to those who indeed obey him. So there's another Christian, shall I say, virtue. It is obedience. Obedience. Well, when they heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay him. But then God always has his witnesses. And there's a certain man amongst the council and uh, he was a Pharisee, he was a teacher of the law, and held in great reputation. His name was Gamaliel, he was a doctor of the law, and uh, he just commanded that the apostles' disciples be pushed to the side for a little bit, and said unto them, and now he's speaking to the council, Ye men of Israel, take heed. Take heed to yourselves what you intend to do. He said, now, you know, before you act, let's soberly consider these situations. And he said, you know, before this time, there rose up a man, Theodos, boasting himself to be somebody to whom a number of men, about 400, joined themselves, who were slain, and all as many as obeyed him were scattered and brought to naught. (coughs) And then he said, there was a man, Judas of Galilee, in the days of the taxi and drew away much people. He also perished, and all, as even as many obeyed him, were dispersed. Now, he said, look, we've got historical fact that there were men who declared that they were somebody, but, you know, after a time it was proven they were not, and they were slain. And so he goes on, and this is very important, verse 38. He said, and now I say unto you, refrain from these refrain from these men and let them alone he said leave them alone don't touch them he said well if this council or this work be of men it will come to naught he said man's work always fails and these other people who claim to be great men he said what happened They lost their lives and their work came to nothing. So he said it's very clear indeed that it was the works of men, not of God. So then he said, if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. We've seen that in prior situations. It will come to naught. But, now verse 39 is very clear. But if it be of God, he cannot overthrow it. Lest haply ye be found even to fight against God. In other words, look, let's examine the situation. Here are these people preaching Jesus of Nazareth. And uh, we have a different doctrine to us. Yes, that's true. Now then, if all this that they preach is the work of men, it will come to nothing. Absolute nothing. 
But if this work is of God, you see, ye cannot overthrow it. It's happily ye be found even to fight against God. He said, if God is in this, you can't fight against God. And so they agreed. And they agreed, and uh, then they called the apostles, beat them. They commanded they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And so uh, that was the agreement with Gamaliel, the teacher of the law. If these things are of men, it would come to nothing. And, And that's the thing in life, you see. You know, people have tried to fight against the church. But they can't. Because the church is of God. And it's impossible to overthrow the church. Well, then uh, in verse 41, they departed from the presence of the council, that is, the disciples, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And did they give up? No. They continued. And daily in the temple, and in every house they ceased not to preach and teach Jesus Christ. And we shall see this in the coming of revival, that Jesus Christ will be taught in every house everywhere. And may we listen to the truth. God bless you.